I'd like to begin by giving you a little bit of a piece of information. This sermon was purchased at the fall church auction, and the topic that I was given, which I am doing a little bit differently at every service, is big data. Data is everywhere. Individual bits of information pour from every moment of our daily life. Internet browser caches, credit card usage, and cell phone tracking are familiar data generators. But there is also data being collected from traffic patterns, buildings, trains, buses, boats, planes, bridges, companies, and factories. According to a writer for Harvard Magazine, the data flow is so fast that the total accumulation of the past two years, what they call a zettabyte, dwarfs the prior record of all of the data of human civilization. Imagine that for just a minute. The data collected over the last two years is more than all the data that we've collected in human civilization. The amount of data is incredible. But it's not the amount that is actually that revolutionary. It's not even the exponential growth of storage or computational capacity. The revolution lies in our newfound ways of connecting and experiencing that data. There's an entirely new profession grounded in creating visual models from data sets that allows people to be able to see patterns in ways that were simply not possible just a year ago. And these are generating new insights in all disciplines. And knowledge is power. But the data itself is not powerful. It's the meaning or the linkages of the data that is powerful and that depends on what problem you're trying to solve and what questions you actually ask. So it's not just the size of your data that matters. It's what you do with it. No matter how much data is actually gathered, you still have to ask the right questions to create a hypothesis, design a test, and determine whether the hypothesis is actually true. But there is a difference between probability and prediction. One of my favorite go-to books where science and culture meets philosophy is a little book called The Universe and the Teacup. In it, author Casey Cole writes, the idea that science possesses a crystal ball that can look accurately into the future is as old as science itself. There's a myth that suggests that prediction is merely a matter of accumulating enough information. It's the belief that the future is already locked up in the present by events in the past, and that all you really need to figure it out is the missing information. As Cole suggests, prediction is neither the goal nor the forte of science. Truth be told, physicists can't even perfectly predict where a ping pong ball will bounce on the other side of a table. We can predict the patterns of a lunar eclipse, but we can't even predict the weather. There's some confusion, though, among scientists and among the general population around what theory actually is. Theories are not about predicting the future, she says. Theories are really about predicting the present. Chemists, for example, can predict what will happen if certain elements are brought together under certain conditions in the moment, but they cannot predict what will happen next week. It's all still valuable information, but it is about what is, not about what will be. So as physicist Frank Oppenheimer wrote, prediction is dependent entirely on an assumption. And that assumption is that observed patterns will be repeated. Now because of the patterns of our everyday lives, we could be fooled into believing that we actually know way more than we really do. Cole writes, prediction should serve as guide posts, not goal posts. Now, based on my lived experience, I can predict a number of things. 
The sun will likely come up tomorrow. My daughter will inevitably tell me she is not tired when she is at her sleepiest. My knee will ache when the barometric pressure drops. But these are merely patterns in my experience. Now, I don't know about you, but in all matters concerning people in the world, I am best served in my meaning making when I hold the patterns of the past loosely. Just because I've always done something doesn't mean I have to make that choice again. Just because your spouse, child, parent, or boss has always done it that way doesn't mean that that's how they will always behave. In fact, your anticipating that behavior may in fact encourage the behavior to continue. So depending on patterns of the past does not account for or create space for generativity or maturity, autonomy or creativity or shifting preference. We will be better served knowing the patterns, but being open to the experience as it unfolds in the moment that we are in, so that we can all have room to grow. Now, another difficulty with the science of prediction regarding big data is that correlation does not equal causation. Two events can consistently correlate with each other, but not have any actual causal relationship. Now, an easy example of this is the relationship between reading ability and shoe size. If someone performs such a survey, they will inevitably find that the larger shoe sizes correlated with better reading ability. But what does it actually tell us? It does not mean that large feet cause good reading skills. It instead, it is caused by the fact that young children have small feet and have not yet or only recently been taught to read. In this case, the two variables are more accurately correlated with a third, age. Now the part age plays in this example is known as a confounding variable, data that was not controlled for in the association of the data. There's a correlation of the number of storks and the birth rate in Denmark. <laughs> but one did not cause the other. At the start of the 20th century, it was noted that there was a strong correlation between the number of radios and the number of people in insane asylums, but one did not, in fact, cause the other. Now, this is easy to observe and check with only a few variables, but with the increasing variables of big data, it becomes more and more difficult to catch merely with our common sense. Now, even though this is clear to most scientists, correlation is used all the time, sometimes with intent and some other times accidentally, to influence the way in which we perceive the world. Now, let me take even further one step back. We're actually making an assumption about the data even before a single question is asked. You see, to datafy a phenomenon is to put put it in a quantified format so that it can be tabulated and analyzed. And to quantify something, you have to identify and define very specific characteristics. So we have limited the outcome simply and merely in the counting, simply by deciding what to measure. So let us not forget that we do, in fact, need to spend a little bit of time making sure that we all agree on the definition of what is, is. Exactly. Four apples plus four oranges equals eight pieces of fruit, or can we not compare apples to oranges at all? That depends on the question. What are we trying to determine? It depends on the level of system that we're actually examining and for what purpose. So having a goal in mind or a theory or a hypothesis shapes the kind of results that we get. And we've even learned that the mere fact of observing actually influences what's being observed. People and places, things, atoms, electrons, especially children, are influenced by our very observation. On the other hand, having no goal in mind, like data mining or data dredging, can prove nearly anything or nothing at all. 
So what does it say about humanity that we carry around in our phones more than the sum total of the information acquired in human history, and even in our pockets even, and we mostly use it to look at videos of cats. <laughs> Does it actually predict a decline in IQ? <laughs> An increase in affection for cats? An increase in apathy about the general world? Or does it really tell us nothing at all? Where big data has been extremely effective thus far, though, has been in marketing, predicting future purchases. Based on previous purchase history, the Amazon recommendations engine is just one of those examples. Now, we have similar algorithms as these that have effectively learned how to play chess and those that can predict even the outcome of Supreme Court, Supreme Court cases better than expert human beings. Credit card companies have been using big data to predict risk of default of payment. And just so you know, one of those correlations, evidently those who buy anti-scuff pads for their furniture are more likely to make their payments than those who don't. <laughs> but the problem with that kind of information is that now that you know this data, awareness of the data can, future, can skew future data. So the new question will be, why are so many people who are buying anti-scuff pads applying for credit cards? supposed to be funny, right? <laughs> In the public realm, big data has been used to predict where and when crimes are most likely to occur, and in finding associations between air quality or water quality and health. Now, I am all for science. I am pro-information, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But the majority of the world would prefer to have their data filtered for them. There's just so much data that makes sense and yet stakes are high. So there are a few problems with big data of which I wish we were all a little bit more aware as this new genre unfolds. So I'm gonna spend time telling you about four of them. Problem number one, people. People have motivations. Power is knowledge and influence. What you do with your data depends on your goal, and your goals depend on what you want, and what you want depends on what? As one skeptical industry insider says, he is actually the head of the company Intridia. He told the New Yorker, selling big data is a great gig for charlatans, because they also never have to admit being wrong. If their system fails to provide predictive insight, it's not their models, it's an issue with the data. You didn't have enough data, there was too much noise, you measured the wrong things. And so in reality, computational models of most things have historically speaking been wrong, or at least incomplete. Effective only in some circumstances, not in all. And so when big data is in the hands of those in power, even with what seem like lofty goals in mind, we run into trouble. So here's one way in which big data is being used with good intention, but with terrifying impact. The Chicago Police Department has ramped up the use of its predictive analysis system to identify people it believes are likely to commit crimes. These people who are placed on a quote, heat list, end quote, and then they are visited by police officers who tell them that they are considered pre-criminals by the Chicago Police Department and are warned that if they do in fact commit any crimes, they are likely to be caught. The Chicago Police Department actually defends this practice. The technical champion of this data set is a scientist from Illinois Institute of Technology, and he characterizes this process and algorithm as, quote, a neutral data-driven system for preventing crime in a city that has struggled with street violence and other forms of crime. Wernick's approach involves seeking through the data for abnormal patterns that correlate with crime. He compares it with approaches to predicting disease outbreaks, stating that, quote, people whose social networks have violence within them are also likely to commit violence. Neutral. Are you kidding me? Neutral data, he says. Now, although this may be correlative, it's not predictive. And with the power only in the hands of the few, it is likely 
prescriptive. Where you are looking for arrests, you will indeed find them. We see this even here in Tulsa. It's kind of a chicken and an egg issue here. Are there more crimes in North Tulsa, which is why we need more police officers placed there? Or are there more police officers there, and so there are more crimes reported? I wonder what the crime map would look like if cocaine and marijuana were equally patrolled across the city. This Chicago PD procedure is a serious problem. Not only because they aren't transparent about what data they're actually using, but the entire assumption that you are guilty by association is in fact unconstitutional and for good reason. It reminds me of what's going on in Uganda right now with regards to the LGBT community. If you know about illegal homosexual activity, you are to report it. And if you do not, it is also a crime. We know because of transparent and rigorous independent scholarship across the country over time that police intervention is not, in fact, neutral in Chicago or elsewhere. From searches to arrests, prosecution to sentencing laws, current crime data is embedded in a wider culture in which human beings with social power can and do make subjective decisions about individual acts. So being prescriptive based on bad data is just perpetuating an already established problem at the expense of the rights of our citizens. Garbage in, garbage out. Problem number two, people. <laughs> people have limited access to theory. We are not a country or a planet of equal access to education now, nor do I believe we ever have been. And so the data and the capacity to understand that data lies in the hands of the few, those who can afford it, those who use it, and understand it. Currently, there aren't enough people comfortable dealing with petabytes of information. I can't even conceive of what a petabyte is. But I suspect that big data analysis will become a foundational study material for all undergraduates in nearly every discipline in the coming years and will be as basic and probably as misunderstood as manipulated as statistics already are today. But we need people who understand big data who are not driven by consumerism to be able to have the checks and balances of the results. Big data has incredible implications for helping us find new solutions to long-standing problems. And it's both frightening and exciting to me to think that our three-year-old daughter will only know a world where big data analysis has existed. And she will always have been marketed to in this way. How will that shape how she views herself and her definition of what she wants and what she needs? Carol Cogwaller of The Observer wrote, Google will know the answer to your question before you have even asked it. Based on every email you've ever written, every document, every idle thought you ever typed into a search engine box, it will likely know you even better than your intimate partner does, perhaps better than you even know yourself. Amazon predicts that it will know exactly what you want to buy before you buy it and will ship it to your doorstep before you order it via a drone. <laughs> it's going to happen. <laughs> and the crazy thing is, like, I can think of some things that might be on that list that I would like to have delivered to my door. <laughs> but knowing who Google and Facebook thinks you are will, in fact, influence who you are think you are. This is exactly the concept of a future espoused by big data, a new speculative form of personal identity that is in fact ethically questionable. How does it redefine the sense of the individual, free will and autonomy that we all strive to realize? What does it mean for a massive network to know what you want and need even better than yourself? Now, until education catches up, this power lies in the hands of the few. Problem number three, got a guess? People. Safeguarding data and privacy implications. 
It used to be you are what you do. Today, you are who and what you like, as in what you indicated your likes are on Facebook. You are your responses to the quizzes that you have taken, the groups you join, your posts and searches. But just because I'm curious about something doesn't necessarily mean I believe it. I don't want to know who Google thinks I am based on my searches. I have looked up some pretty crazy stuff. But we are all more complicated than our searches or our actions or our likes infer. Take, for example, my volunteering at the abortion clinic. Just because I volunteer at the abortion clinic doesn't mean that I necessarily would have one or have had one. It doesn't mean that I would recommend even that you have one if you came to me. So what data can you glean from knowing that I volunteer at the abortion clinic? There's some correlative things that you might suggest. Interestingly, that I listen to NPR. People are walking contradictions. And getting to the core of the principle of the matter takes more than just a glimpse of what I like or who I associate with or how I spend my time. But the question is, who benefits from all of this information and access to it? In some sense, we do. The user does. But it is the access to all of this data that not only sells us stuff we want, it also makes predictions. If Target can predict that we're pregnant based on previous purchases, then what will insurance companies do with the information it could glean from the internet? What about the government? Knowing who I have called on the telephone is one level of privacy invaded. Knowing what I have typed in a search engine box is another. Reading my emails, another. Data is power and it is money. There are plenty of companies who will not even release their data, their consumer data or otherwise. And so at the present time, we have this current clash of data hoarders and privacy issues. So the problem with big data is not big data. It's people, people, and more people. And so the final problem with big data that I'll discuss with you this morning is also grounded in people. People do not typically take risks on hard data. Now, I don't know about you, but most of the big risks that I have taken in my life would not have been probable or predicted merely by analyzing the data of my life up to that point. Ron Baker, founder of the Verisage Institute, wrote, it's simply impossible to know how to do something until you attempt to do it. It's the leap, not the look or the big data that generates the indispensable understanding of being able to necessitate progress. Sometimes we do something before we even know why we did something. And it can only be understood in hindsight. <clears throat> Looking backwards through time, there might be a narrative that can be told, but in the moment of decision-making, our discernment is personal. We are the ones who give weight to the facts and circumstances in ways that would parallel no one else's choice, although someone might understand it if I explain those choices after the fact. In the data world, you see, what is relevant or interesting is only what is actionable. Soft data, or the data that cannot be measured and defined with specificity, has probably had more of an impact on major decisions in my life than hard data ever will. Nathan Eagle writes, the mathematization of subjectivity will founder upon the resplendent fact that we are ambiguous beings. We frequently have mixed feelings, and we're divided even against ourselves. We use different words to communicate similar thoughts, but those words are not even synonyms. Though we dream of exactitude and transparency, our meanings are often only approximate and obscure. We are also self-interpreting beings, which means we deceive ourselves and each other. We even lie. It's true that we make our own choices and we translate our feelings into actions, but a choice is often a coarse and inadequate translation of a feeling. And a full picture of our inner states cannot always be inferred 
from our actions. This reminds me of a a story that had a significant impact on how I view the, the interplay between hard and soft data. It's one of Oliver Sacks's patients from the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Sacks was working with a man who had incurred a brain injury and damaged the emotional center of his brain, and all predictions were that he would be extra- extraordinarily reasonable, a Spock-like character of sorts more reasonable than the average person who it was believed is burdened with emotion around decision-making. The truth is that the patient was incapable of making a decision because the patient had no personal preference. So in attempting to make a doctor's appointment, Tuesday was always just as good as Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday because he could find just as many pros and cons for each day. He had no emotional preferences to assist him in making up his mind. Value neutral for him simply created a standstill. So in essence, the problem with big data is people, how it is used. And the solution is probably, in fact, people as well. In the New Republic, Leon Weisteller writes that the Amazon Rotten Tomatoes view of life is that datification represents an essential enrichment in human marketing. But marketing is hardly the supreme or most consequential human activity. The religion of information is just another superstition, another distorting totalitarianism, another counterfeit deliverance. In some ways, the technology is transforming us into brilliant fools. In the comprehensively quantified existence in which we presume to believe that eventually we'll know everything. In the expanding universe of prediction in which we hope, in which hope and longing will come to seem obsolete and merely ignorant, we're renouncing some of the most valuable and primary human experiences. And so we need people to continue to rally for emotion and spirit and hope and revelation Have you Googled yourself lately? When you Google me, you'll find that I am a minister and a mother, a wife, that I've been divorced, I'm a singer, a songwriter, an author, a columnist, a consultant, an executive coach, a trainer, a teacher, a volunteer at the abortion clinic, a triathlete, that doesn't mean I still do that by the way, so don't assume. You can find my family tree dating back to the 1700s, and actually my DNA is even attached to that. You can track all my sermons, and you might be able to extrapolate what interested me at the time. If you get on my Facebook, you'll find a lot about what I like. You can friend me on Spotify and see what music I listen to. But none of this really tells you who I am or what I believe, and neither does it for you. What I prefer or how I weigh my values is not predicted by what I check in a box. It is simply information to add to the mix. But there are a thousand assumptions to make about me and about you with each data piece found. But it doesn't tell you what we value most. What I can tell you is that even in light of a letter that you may have received in the mail, the soft data that is guiding me today is that my heart has and always will belong to this church and that my ministry, no matter how it's recrafted, will continue to be here as long as that ministry serves you well. Amen.